So um, I'm sorry, I don't have quite so much uh, things about Mike, but I mean, my um, my first encounter with Mike was back in the mid 1980s when I was still at Imperial College. And uh, for various reasons, even though he was working at BRE, he was employed through Imperial College. And um, yeah, so we knew quite a lot about each other. And that's when he started working on fly ash and how fly ash could uh, suppress ASR. And um, when I came back to uh, EPFL, this is a subject we came back to. So what I'm going to present here is a compilation of results from two theses, uh, one of Theo Chape, which finished in 2012. So it's a bit old, but probably people have forgotten about it by now. And one quite recent of Masha Bagheri, which finished this year. So um, the starting point, I mean, I think everybody knows what ASR is. I think this is kind of a nice picture of the kind of aggregates we have in um, Switzerland. So they, often we have aggregates which are pretty much quartz, which everybody reckons is an unreactive uh, material. But what you can see here is that you get very, you know, you get the reaction that goes along grain boundaries, because of course, at any grain boundary of any material, you have amorphous material, which is more vulnerable to attack. And the starting point for our work was the kind of anecdotal observation people had made that if you had SCMs with aluminum in, they were better at suppressing ASR than ones with just silica in. So this was our starting point. And these results here show you a kind of not a very good test method, but one where you have a, a surfeit of alkali. So everything expands in the end. But we can see the more you have add either of silica fume or of metakaolin, the more it is suppressed. And in each set, the metakaolin ones are doing better than the silica fume ones. So the system we made here was a system where we had um, the same amount of silica in these systems, but um, basically the alumina changed. So we had metakaolin on the one hand, which contains silica and alumina, and then um, silica fume and quartz filler. So we had the same silica, but we had alumina. And we did lots of different test methods. And the first thing we really wanted to look at uh, was how did we change the CSH? So you see here are uh, some microanalysis of the CSH. You can see in the silica fume systems, as you add more and more silica fume, the uh, calcium to silicon ratio of the CSH goes down. That's to say the silicon to calcium goes up. And a similar thing happens with the metakaolin, although in the metakaolin case, you can see that the amount of aluminium incorporated in the CSH always go also goes up. And the hypothesis was at the time that that increase in aluminium and the CSH would be the factor that um, affected ASR by lowering more the uh, alkali content. But when we expressed the pore solutions, we found that this wasn't true. Um, here is the alkalinity of the pore solutions. And again, we've got these sets of measurements. So that's 5% silica fume quartz, and that's 5% metakaolin. And in each of these sets, you can see that actually the alkalinity in the metakaolin cases is actually slightly higher than in the silica fume cases. And we made this rather complicated analysis. You can read that up about it in the paper if you're interested to really try and calculate how much uh, alkali was fixed in the CSH. And you can see that, um, in, you know, that basically what I said to you before that if anything, the metakaolin is fixing less alkali than the silica fume. So the hypothesis that was in the um, literature, uh, we saw that what didn't really fit the facts. So we looked into this a bit more and what we did find that also the pore solution with the metakaolin samples contains quite high, con well, contains some concentration of alumina. I can't really say it's high, it's around one millimole, so it's quite low. And then we took another approach, which was to look at how the aggregates behaved in those different pore solutions. So in alkaline pore solution, and then containing uh, some aluminium. And we used this um, image analysis technique to track the amount of damage in the aggregates. Here you can see a, a, an aggregate, and basically we um, find all the pores and cracks in the aggregates and we quantify those. So these results here show you 
the same alkalinity of the pore solution, but with different concentrations of aluminium. So you can see the reactive fraction is quite high in the um, solution, which is just alkaline. But when you start to add some aluminium to the same solution, then you see the amount of reaction is very, very much suppressed. The amount of reaction here is very much less than the amount of reaction uh, in the top example. And we went on to um, study that in more detail. We used uh, XPS to see how aluminium could be absorbed on the silica. And the one very nice experiment uh, Theo did was to take this disc of amorphous silica and treat half of this disc in a pretreatment with quite a low solution of aluminium. And then after that pretreatment for 90 days to rotate the disc by 90 degrees and um, expose it in, again, in alkali solution, but this time with no aluminium. And the results you can see are really quite uh, striking. Uh, this is the virgin aggregate. So, you know, this is the native state of this amorphous silica. The two quarters that have been pretreated, you see, are not attacked. Even this quarter, which has subsequently been exposed in alkali, and this is the untreated quarter. So when it's untreated, you can see this heavy attack on the disc, but when it's been pretreated and alumina has been allowed to absorb on the surface, then you get really no reaction at all. So it was kind of this that we followed up in this second project, with Massa Bagheri, and this was part of a, what's called a Synergia project in Switzerland. Um, this was a collaborative project between EPFL and EMPA and PSI, and it's just about finished now, but um, it's been going on for the last four or five years. And this was the first project where we really wanted to look uh, more at pure uh, dissolution. Um, one very nice technique the student developed was what we call the scratch, scratch tracking technique. And the advantage of this is you can really see the dissolution of minerals directly. Um, as I'll explain later, sometimes solution experiments can give you misleading results. Um, and the other thing this revealed was that the extent of attack on quartz and on feldspar was pretty much the same. So here you can see, this is before dissolution, you have some scratches which are left over from the polishing. After 21 days in alkali solution, you see those scratches are where the attack is concentrated and after 60 days. And by very carefully um, coating and then uncoating the sample, you can go back to exactly the same area and you can see how these cracks uh, develop. So um, as well as this scratch tracking, she measured the uh, effect of a lot of different uh, salts on the dissolution of aggregates. So basically, um, you know, we've got a, a, a basic alkali solution of 400 millimoles of sodium. And then with the addition of other things like sulfate or cesium or lithium, the series that's really the most interesting is the series with aluminium, because here you can see how different concentrations of aluminium very dramatically suppress the dissolution. You could think here uh, that for these red ones, when you have calcium and lithium, this is also suppressing the dissolution, but this shows you the problem of dissolution experiments uh, that when you have either calcium present, you precipitate CSH. When you have lithium present, you precipitate lithium uh, silicate. And this means that the measurements you get just purely from a dissolution experiment are quite misleading. And that's where the scratch tracking method comes into its own, because now you can use this method to see how these different minerals behave uh, with different concentrations in solution. And um, this is the uh, one with the aluminium, which has by far the lowest. This is the reference, which just has the alkalis. 
And here you can see the one with calcium, here you can see the one with lithium, and here the one with sulfate. And all those three cases of calcium, of lithium, and sulfate all, in fact, increase the amount of dissolution. So, you know, the result from the solution experiments was really erroneous. And this is just a summary of her dissolution results. Um, here you can see that all of these quartz, feldspars, and amorphous silica can all be attacked. Um, when, when you have as well the presence either of iron or magnesium uh, or additional um, sodium ions, but not, not additional alkalinity or, calcium, or potassium ions or cesium ions, no effect. Sulfate, calcium, and lithium increase it, and the aluminium drastically decreases it. So, of course, the proof is how does this all work out in concrete? And here's the real problem that, um, as with many PhDs, the actual concretes only get a chance to go to two years, which is not really long enough to prove whether they're going to expand or not. But we did look at the expansion at elevated temperatures, both at 40 degrees and 60 degrees. And we did this with the samples immersed in a simulated pore solution. So it's not a situation where you have leaching, you have pore, simulated pore solutions surrounding the samples. And we also extracted the pore solution. So what you can see in terms of the pore solution, you can see in general, the addition of the SEMs is suppressing the alkalinity and the amount of suppression increases as the amount of addition increases. So this is really basically the same result as we saw in the first PhD. Um, but again, when you look at the aluminium, you see that um, you only get aluminium in solution when you have fairly um, high amounts of metacaolin. And um, what's important is the concentrations of aluminium you have in the real concretes are very much in the same range that was sufficient to suppress the dissolution of amorphous silica in the first part of the experiments. And then, as I said, um, you know, we look at the concretes and you see ones that expand, as you'd expect, because they were reactive aggregates. And you see, in general, the SEMs suppress expansion. Now, I have to be honest, and I have to say here that at this stage, we can't really distinguish between the suppression of the reaction due just simply to lowering the alkalinity of the concretes and that um, which would come also from the presence of alumina. But we're hoping, and we're going to track these samples for longer times, we're hoping to see as time goes on a stronger differentiation between the um, silica fume, which has no aluminium, and the metacaolin, which has aluminium. While we're at it, we also looked at, at lithium. And, um, you know, the results of lithium are really a bit mitigated. It seems to suppress quite well at 40, but at 60, the lith ones containing lithium actually still expanded. So um, that's basically uh, my presentation. Uh, just as a very short conclusion, um, I really want to stress that in all this work we've done, what we've seen is that the way these different SEMs suppress alkali silica reaction is of course, first and foremost, by lowering the alkalinity. And they do that by forming calcium silicate hydrate with a lower calcium to silicon ratio that absorbs more alkali. However, the suppression of the silica dissolution by aluminum in solution is also important. And uh, we think for this reason that calcine clays, which have um, a very good capacity to lower CO2 emissions, also have an outstanding potential to mitigate ASR. And we have got samples from other sets of experiments that are now about eight years old, exposed in poor solution, which are still performing very well, but of course not as long-term as the field exposure test, which I know Benoit and Jason are gonna tell you about next. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, I hope maybe you have some questions. Okay, so the first one is what about nanosilica to prevent um, ASR in concrete? Well, 
What I tried to explain was that the action of silica additions is really by changing the composition of the CSH. So I don't fundamentally think nano silica is going to be really any different from silica fume. Uh, silica fume reacts and changes the composition of the CSH. Nano silica will do the same. Um, what I really wanted to emphasize is in all the work we've done, though, we see that um, you will have, of course, a benefit from these silica additions, but you'll get much more benefit if you have an addition that contains silica and alumina. There was another question here, which seems like kind of an open question, but I'll go ahead and share it, and you can address it how you wish. It says, does this mean that lithium as a mitigation to suppress ASR does not work? Well, I think uh, you should refer that to the next presentation where they have much more long-term results, because ASR is always a problem of how you do your experiments. And, of course, we apply, we apply higher temperatures to speed things up. Uh, people may say that's changing it things but certainly when we exposed the lithium containing samples at 60 they expanded pretty well they expanded a lot and then a question here do calcine clays potentially lower reactivity sufficiently that we can use bad aggregate and bads in quotes or only that we don't need to be as careful yeah it's an interesting question and it's always a question of how long have you done your experiments i'm cautiously optimistic that you can't could use bad aggregates because as i say we've got had experiments running at 40 degrees in simulated poor solution for about seven or eight years now and uh, there's no sign of any expansion um but it would be nice to get some of these more into field testing uh, i think it's also really important to say that it, it's in in if we look at lc3 uh, it's very important that you have quite a bit of this calcine clay. You have 30% of this calcine clay. And, and certainly if you only have very low additions, like uh, 10%, then you will still get expansion. And there's one more question here. I'm not exactly sure what they're asking. So if I reword this and I get it wrong, I apologize. But the question has to do with limestone powder. And I believe what they're asking is, does limestone powder in any way um, uh, impact the reaction of aluminum with calcium hydroxide? I don't quite understand that question either. Um, the react, yeah, well, I, maybe I do. The reaction you get in LC3 cements is a reaction between calcium carbonate and alumina and calcium hydroxide to form calcium aluminate hydrates like um, monocalcium aluminate, hemicarboaluminate. So in that sense, that reaction does also need calcium hydroxide. But I don't understand what they're asking about expansion. I think in this case of ASR expansion, it doesn't really make any difference because it's all to do with the alumina in solution. At this point in time, it appears that there still really is no ASR treatment for structures with ASR distress. Is that your understanding? That's my understanding. I'm afraid once you've got it in a structure, you are not really going to. I mean, you know, you, if you have a, a quite small element, you can dry it out. That works quite well. But I mean, in Switzerland here, we're working very much with dams, like some 20 to 30 percent of the dams in Switzerland are affected by ASR. And forget about trying to dry out a dam. You're never going to do that.